Hello everyone, today is Thursday, April 7, 2016, and this is the week in charts. This week's charts, week in charts I should say, is brought to you once again by me. So I guess uh, now that we're getting into the year, I might have to change my graphic on this. I woke up thinking about that this morning. But so far, it's been kind of bumpy. Mark has been kind of all over the place, and so far, so good. We've been taking the setups as we see them. In a lot of cases, just kind of sitting on our hands. And you can go to that area on my website and check that out. Um, I would give you some information to delayed service earlier. If you can't wait till the end, you could just go to getting started on my website. And if you look at the list of uh, things to getting started there, you'll find the delayed service too. And I'll be following up with you guys on some more information there soon. Okay. There's a disclaimer screen. Let me just sum it up really quickly. All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can be happen can happen between now and then. One thing I was thinking about today, especially, uh, or I should say thinking about recently quite a bit, I've been having a lot of people email me things like, hey, Dave, I didn't honor the stop on, on XYZ. What should I do now? Hey, Dave, I didn't take the entry on this recommendation. What should I do now? And it really got me thinking about decisions. And every time you make a decision, there's two things that happens. One, there are emotions attached to that decision, as I said uh, Denise Scholl and uh, Damasio have both talked about the fact that you cannot make any decision without emotions. And that really struck a chord with me. I was uh, speaking in San Francisco a few years back, and I listened to Denise speak, and she talked about that. It just made, it made a lot of sense. So it actually has kind of got me thinking in life in general. Whenever I start to make a decision, I embrace and don't try to control those emotions well with every emotion comes stress so you can't make a decision without emotions and then you can't make a decision without stress so let's say the plan was to enter AROC at 640 so the stock triggers the next day but you didn't take it okay so the following day, I should say, so the stock triggers, but you didn't take it. So the next day, you're now faced with a decision. Let's say the stock price is higher. Do you get in even though the price is higher? Well, that decision is going to come with some emotions and some stress. And what if the stock price is lower? Well, that decision is going to come with some emotions and stress. And then maybe the price is the same. So that's yet another possible decision you're faced with and then the other decision would be not to do anything and that's going to come with emotions and stress so each time that you don't make a decision you're creating more and more decisions for you so with every new decision comes more and more stress and more and more emotions so the more you fail to follow your plan the more decisions you're going to make and the more emotions and stress you're going to be deal with, dealing with and I ran out of time but this I was going to take this graphic out further and further and further so obviously this whole conversation is talking about the fact that you have to Plan that trade and follow the plan. By the way, right before the show started, I was thinking about the problems with something like day trading. Well, day trading, you're making a lot of decisions. And there's a pretty bad burnout factor there. As I've said quite a bit, any profession that you have to make a lot of decisions on the fly has a tremendous burnout rate, such as, I guess, like an air traffic controller would be a good example of that and I've known a couple of day traders who have gone crazy or at least in one case falling off the face of the earth I have no idea what happened to some of these people so 
very few people are wired for that. Now, day trading seems kind of exciting, seems kind of cool. You go in and get a paycheck every day from the market. Well, it's not quite that easy. And we're just not made to make that many decisions. I think there are a select few of us that have a different makeup that can do that. But even if you have that sort of makeup, I think there's still a possibility that you could, you're just suppressing those emotions and those feelings that in one day – it could all come to head, and maybe that's what happened with some of these aforementioned day traders. So if you want to day trade the day trade, I'm just not a big fan of it, and I think that it just creates a lot of decisions. Now, I don't want to get too far sidetracked. The point I'm making here is when you fail to make these decisions, and then now you're faced with a new decision, then you end up with more and more and more decisions, and it just kind of snowballs from there and grows geometrically. So you have to reduce the amount of decisions that you're making. And one thing you need to do is plan while things are static. And Montier says that, uh, pointed out that stress changes, emotion changes, emotions increase Stress increases, I should say, when information is changing or uncertain. Well, that's markets. As soon as that market opens, it's either higher, lower, sideways, or it might be a little bit of, of both. So the point is that getting back to that decision tree we had earlier, it could sort of snowball from there. So you must plan while things are static. As I often say, I, I drink a lot of coffee in the afternoons, or at least one huge cup, while I look at charts. And, and that's kind of a relaxing time of the day for me. It's something I really enjoy doing. Uh, I, I would I would do – it's just something that I – I guess I enjoy it because it's like being on a treasure hunt every day. And once you make that plan – I know it's cliche, but trying to uh, – Plan to trade and trade the plan. Maybe I had too much coffee already today, okay? But once you make that plan, follow that plan. Now, one way to help you follow that plan is to let the markets make decisions for you. Now, I know I do preach a little bit of discretion, and we're probably going to touch upon that at some point in this presentation because we had one come within two cents of a profit target last week. But that's kind of like more advanced. You have to get to that point before you could actually start doing that. And, yes, it does increase the, the number of decisions. But what I'm talking about here is if you can let the market make as many decisions for you as possible. And one way to do that is let's say you had a setup coming in today. Let's say your entry's up here somewhere. And the market, let's say the market opens here, okay, below your entry. So what you could do is, after you watch that open, you can put in a stop market order and then go about your life, okay? So if the market starts dropping like a stone, you don't get triggered in. If the market rallies, then you get triggered in. And at least at that particular moment in time, the market is moving in your favor. I'm going to take a step back in a few minutes, and I guess I should have done this first. But I do want to cover some basics here that, that I think a lot of people are lacking, or at least based on my new emails. I think we've got a new batch of people coming in, and we need to get them up to speed as quickly as possible. But when we talk about entries in one second, you want to enter on strength, even if that strength is just that intraday short-term strength. And you could put in a stop market order, good for the day only, and go about your life. Go exercise. Go spend some time with some loved ones or take care of your patients or whatever you're doing in your other career. And let that market trigger you in. Another thing you could do, and, you know, one thing I need to point out is, and I, I, I got to be careful not to make the joke again in case my wife's listening or watches the recording. But, you know, making decisions is easy. Living with them is not. So you have to, whatever decision you make, 
you have to embrace the consequence of what that decision will bring. And that's why there are emotions with a decision because there is a consequence if you take the trade or not. If you take the trade, you might lose money, but you might make money. Okay, there's going to be a consequence. If you don't take the trade, the stock might take off without you. And then you're going to watch it ang anguish and get pissed off. And then guess what? You have more and more emotions. And by the way, as you start making more and more decisions, and again, an indecision is also a decision too. If you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice like Rush once said. The, the band, not the fat guy. The angry fat guy, I should say. Anyway, it can create this negative feedback loop, creating more and more decisions and more and more stress. So if you can have the market make as many decisions for you and then live with them, then you could do just fine. Now, somebody emailed me. We had a profit target on AROC, which we're going to talk about in a minute, I guess, of A20. We talked about this one last week. Go and watch last week's show. And it went to 818. Didn't quite get there, okay? But this person had a stop limit order, or I should say a limit order, not a stop order. A limit order to sell it at 820. That means that he wants at least eight dollars and twenty cents for the stock. And it didn't quite get there, so the order didn't trigger. But the point I'm trying to make is for that partial profit taking, you could have that limit order in place. And if none of this is making sense to you, go to the end of the presentation, watch that, then rewind it because in the end, I'm going to go through some of the basics really quick. But get a, go about your life, and then you could actually – the market could actually pay you while you're away. I've done that before. It's kind of a fun thing to do. Uh, ideally, I like to try to squeeze out a little more profits when possible or use a little discretion when it gets within spitting distance of that target. But if I have to be away, sometimes I might throw a limit order in. It's like, oh, I got paid while I was away. And I call it a pay me order sometimes because sometimes the market will spike up and fill that limit order for you and then come right back in. So if you weren't watching the screen, which I, I would recommend you don't watch every tick unless, like I talked about last week, you set an alarm at a level or if you know the stock's close to a level where you have to take some action. But – there are a lot of things you could do to make the decision a passive one. And, and I ran out of time before the presentation. But what I was thinking also is let's say you're you're in a position, okay, and then it starts turning into a stinker. Well, if you have a stop and you get stopped out, so be it. So let a market open. If you're not disciplined, then put in the order before the open. But if you are a little bit more disciplined, Put that stop in, and if you get stopped out, you get stopped out. And that makes life a lot easier than when you're way down here. So now, all of a sudden, you end up with that decision tree that keeps growing and growing and growing and growing. And then you start that, I hate to, I can't think of a better word for it, but mental masturbation, where you start thinking, well, I can't sell out now. It's going down too low. And uh, what if I sell out now? I look like an idiot. And, and well, I've already lost this much money. Maybe I'll give it a little more room. And before you know it, that negative feedback loop starts again. So if you have a hard stop in, then it'll take you out. You could use a stop entry. And I'm not a huge fan of limit orders, but as far as like a pay me type of order, you can put a limit order in for half your shares at that profit target. And you want to avoid making decisions because each decision is going to come with a new consequence and a new emotion and new stress. So, again, let the market make as many decisions for you as possible. Okay. Now, another thing you could do is turn your screens off if you have to. I've had many cases where a market's kind of flirting around my stop and – it's weak, and i am got a pretty big loss on my hands. And I'm like, well, should I get out? Should I not? Should I get out? Should I get out? Should I try to Should I try to get out at a better price? Should I? Would, so before you know it, you start making all these different 
not necessarily decisions, but you, you're faced with all these decisions. But all you have to do is just put a hard stop in and turn off your screens if you have to. Now, I've done that before, and one or two things will obviously happen. One, you get stopped out. So be it. And I find that I just kind of want to turn my monitor back on. I see if it stopped out. I just kind of growl a little bit. And then I'm like, hey, uh, maybe I'll go get some lunch. But if I'm sitting there watching every little tick, there's a lot of emotions that get played out as it's going up and down, up and down, up and down. Oh, it's getting close, getting close. Oh, no, oh, oh, it's going up, it's going up, it's going up, it's going up. Damn it, now it's going down, now it's going down. And if I see it begin to implode a little bit, I might even go as far as to check the news. Was there any news of this? It's like, Dave, you don't follow the news. Why would you check the news? Why would you add a new unnecessary piece of information? Why would you add something that could create a new decision to the process when all you have to do is put the stop in place, turn your monitor off. You have to. The second thing that could happen is you go away, you go to lunch, do whatever you want. And when you get back, all of a sudden, the position is back in a plus column. It took off. Didn't stop you out, and it took off. Well, I guarantee you, especially if it went a little further against you, in the meantime, if you sat there and watched every tick, you might be inclined to get out early and try to mitigate that loss. Or, on the flip side, you might try to mitigate the loss by when it comes starts to rally back up to break even, or at least erasing some of that loss. You might say, well, at least I didn't take a full loss. Let me just go ahead and get out now. So you create all these decisions, and you also create a lot of what, what should I do. And then the more than what I should do, it's just kind of all snowballs as you can see. So turn your screens off if you have to. So we should plan trades once a week to reduce stress even more or trade off weekly bars. Well, that's a whole different style of trading. And for me, my niche is, is the daily bars. Um, and then some people argue, well, we did get a turn on a 60-minute chart first. Yeah, the further you drill down, the more noise you're going to have. I like the daily bars because I'm trying to catch a longer-term trend, and I think you could at best predict out a little ways, maybe a week or so out, provided you have a setup. If something looks like it's pulled back, looks like it's getting ready to take off again, especially if you get that trigger – you could follow it for – you could only predict so far out, but you could follow forever. And I think that the daily bar is the way to go with that. You could trade off a weekly. Somebody emailed me last week, and they're a little bit newer to trading, and they keep asking me about this setup. And I'm like, it's too many days of the pullback. And they're like, well, look at the weekly chart. Well, yeah, it's beautiful on a weekly chart, but are you trading off the weekly or are you trading off the daily? Um, for me – you're saying reduce the amount of decisions by only planning once a week. Well, maybe when I, 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 I can't see myself retiring, but maybe when I semi-retire, I'll end up with some sort of, of uh, plan, something like that. But I think a market could move too fast and too far over a several day period not to trade off the daily bars. Now I'll take a peek at the weekly every now and then, like S&P 500 is called sideways for over a year, Russell sideways for going on two years here. So once you get that much sideways movement, then by all means, make sure you're looking at your weekly chart too. But I like to take the signals off the daily. So it's okay to make those decisions after hours. In fact, 90% or 99% of all your decisions should be made after hours while the market is closed. And that way, you don't have that information that's what? Changing or uncertain, okay? Everything is static, at least at that moment in time, so you can plan accordingly without the stress of those things happening. And then 
as I've said before, sometimes I've actually found myself kind of having, it sounds a little weird, but almost like an out-of-body experience where it's like my hand is almost forced and I'm actually making that trade or putting that stop in or putting that stop entry in or getting out of a market. And then afterwards, I'm like, what did I just do? So you have to reach a point where you're able to to follow that plan. I hate to use the word mechanically because that brings in mechanical trading, but almost following that plan mechanically and almost following your discretionary decisions mechanically. I have some friends of mine who like to who, who consider themselves more mechanical trading and they think I'm more mechanical than let on. And I think they're a lot more discretionary than to let on. So I think it's important to reduce the amount of decisions you make. Now, I wrote a column, I think it was last week, a week before, where I talked a lot about, well, it might have been three weeks, time goes by so fast. Anyway, I talked a lot about your next trade and what you should do with your next trade and if you're struggling, what you should do. And before I got into all that, I, I realized, or after I wrote 90% of the article, I was like, well, I guess the first thing is before you take that next trade, you should be adequately capitalized, okay? Now, if you're not rolling in it, then still trade at a small size that, that's meaningless to you. So when I say reduce your share, share size, even if you don't have a lot of money, just make that really, really tidy. And even if you have a lot of money, make sure it's small enough to where it doesn't stress you out. It all depends on the individual. You could have a lot of money and a little money could stress you out. So trade at a size that's even smaller than that. Reducing your share size makes it a lot easier to follow a plan. So I'm only up a hundred bucks. I'm only down a hundred bucks. The stress reduces significantly. Now the other thing is, if you do reduce your share size and you're still not successful, then maybe you need to go back to the books and get educated. Are you picking the best stocks to begin with? Do you have a sound money management plan in place, which allows for limited losses and the potential for unlimited gains. So go back and study. It's like everybody puts himself under all this pressure. And what amazes me is, and, and I don't know how to do this without soft selling, so I'll just come flat out and do it. I get people emailing me, and I'm pretty good about answering emails to a point where it's like, okay, guys, come on. You, you need to go do your homework now before you ask me any more questions. But I'm pretty good at kind of answering questions one by one by one over and over. And a lot of people, what amazes me is they'll go out and lose thousands and thousands of dollars in the market by trading mediocre stocks. And they keep emailing me. And I'm like, no, I didn't like that one because of this or I don't like it. Instead of spending that money in the markets where you're almost sure to lose it, spend some of that money on education. Now, obviously, I'd like you to spend it on my education, but maybe somebody else makes sense to you. But I think that money would be better spent getting educated, okay? And if you don't have a lot of money, then you probably shouldn't be trading, but it's okay to get educated for the point in time when you do. So go go in and watch all the free stuff. Go in and look at all the free stuff. I was working on my website last week or earlier this week, and I'm like, good Lord, I've got 500-something posts out there. There's a lot of good information, if I say so myself. So go in and read all that. 1,565 YouTube videos. Go in and watch all those. Okay? So you, there's a lot of things you could do for free. But before you start putting money in the market, make sure you're fully educated. And that money might be better spent on education. Okay? It's like... The stock selection course is 14 hours. So study those 14 hours, and I guarantee you – oops, did I say guarantee? I can almost guarantee you – how's that? That your stock selection is going to improve, and you'll have fewer losses. And in some cases, I can almost certainly guarantee it because if you're not taking stocks that have overhead supply, if you're not taking stocks that are choppy – if you are taking stocks where the trend's accelerated, where the trend's persistent, where other stocks within the sector agree with it, and everything else I went on and on for 14 hours on, if you're doing all that, 
obviously uh, SEC won't let me guarantee anything, but I can almost guarantee that you're going to be more successful. Garbage in, garbage out is what we used to say in the programming, back in the programming days, back in my prior life, 30 years ago. <laughs> Good Lord, I'm getting old. And it's the same thing with the trade. So your best defense is often a good offense. So just make sure you're getting the best trades to begin with. Now, as I wrote in that article or one of the articles recently, follow the plan for just one trade, okay? Reduce your share size down to where it doesn't really – doesn't matter one way or the other. To where you're, you're – yeah, there's still some emotions attached, but it's like, yeah, so what? I'd spend more money on a round of golf or lunch or uh, classic car parts or whatever you spend your money on. Something, a hobby or something, you'd fritter away your money. But enjoy yourself doing it, okay? So to where it's almost meaningless, a nice meal or whatever. And just follow the plan on your next trade. It, you know, what, what, was, what was exciting for me was – after I wrote that article, a few people emailed me and said, you know what, Dave? You're right. I'm going to do that, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to follow the plan on just that one next trade. And once you do that on one trade and become, as I said, process-oriented, not end result-oriented, you have to follow the process. So if you follow the process and it turned out good or bad or indifferent, then pat yourself on the back for following the process and then rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. Just keep doing that. All right, a lot of questions coming in. Howard says, put three traders in a room. I'll trade the same plan. One wins, one's break even, one loses. All because of how they follow the same plan. Absolutely. Uh, I have clients that do better than me. And I have clients that do a lot worse than me. You know? I have people... I could be I could be hitting it out of the park and have three out of four winners in the portfolio. And they either took the one losing trade and forgot the other three, tried to sharpshoot the signals, or they did take all the trades, but they decided that the other three, they, that was enough. It wasn't going any further. And then on the one losing trade, well, they're kind of hanging on to see if it'll come back. So, yeah, I mean, I forget who it, who it is. And, and Phil, you, you're in here. I see you asking some questions, or you just mentioned that, or somebody mentioned that. Uh, you're, you're pretty good at quoting things. Um, who, Wood Market Wizard said that he could publish his system on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, and it wouldn't affect his fund's performance because nobody would follow it. And he's a famous fund manager. But I see that happen all the time. I get I get a lot of – lately I've been getting a lot of emails saying, hey, Dave, uh, are there a lot of uh, – are you pushing the market around with your signals or is it going to be a problem with people in the service? My answer is no. And I was just telling a, uh, a friend yesterday who's also a client, I was like, you know, if you look at the time in sales – around some of my uh, action points, such as an entry or whatever, you can almost hear crickets. It's like nobody's nobody's trading at that point. Why? Well, they're getting in early. They're trying to beat the system. Or they're, they're sharpshooting signals and decide, eh, I'm not going to take that one or whatever reason it might be. So I fully agree with you on that. It's funny to see you begging people to follow the textbook trading principles of successful traders. Well, you know, I, 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 it's because I give a shit. <laughs> you know, if I didn't give a shit, I could probably make a lot more money in my educational business. But I, I care. And it does stress me out to see people lose money. It, it stresses me out to see people give up when the market's choppy that all of a sudden the market takes off. And if they were just hung in there a little bit longer, they would have made a lot of money, okay? It stresses me out when things are going well to see people let it go to their heads and, and they double down, quit the job, you know, whatever, do stupid things 
because they think they they just going to print money forever, and, and this is the this trading thing is is easy. So I, I care too much, and I know it sounds stupid, but I do. <laughs> of course, I also get disappointed when I see no new setups. Yeah, that's a tough part too, Angelo. And, and, and I'm under a lot of pressure too. And I said this the other day at my service. We had, shoot, I think it's been a week since we had seen a new setup. And I was telling my wife, hey, we got some new guys and girls. Uh, a lot of girls coming on board. And welcome aboard, ladies. Uh, you guys actually make better traders. Ladies make better traders than the guys. And, and that's something that, um, who was it? I wrote about that in one of the columns too. But uh, some hedge fund manager said women are too emotional. I disagree. I think the the ego is worse than emotions when it comes to trading. But I was telling my wife, not to digress too far, but I was saying, I said, hey, we got some new people uh, checking things out, coming into trial rates, seeing, you know, kicking the tires a little bit. And she's like, you got some good setups for them? I'm like, actually, no, there's really nothing to do. And she goes, well, you better find some, huh? And I'm like, nah, I, you know, I'd be nice to, and, and I'm looking and I'm trying, but you can't invent trades if they're not there. You can't try to make something happen. And if you're disappointed because you're not seeing setups, then you have to ask yourself your motive for trading. And waiting and patience is part of the process. Sometimes you just have to wait and be patient. And as I often say, better be on the dock wishing you were out to sea. And that's as a sailor, I often used to feel that way. Then be out to sea wishing you were on a dock. And as a sailor who has been on a boat that was sinking in the middle of the Atlantic, about uh, 300 miles off of Bermuda, <laughs> I can attest that's a that's a true statement. And and as my buddy Greg Morris says it even better, better to be on the ground wishing you in the air. He's a ex fighter pilot, an airline pilot, than be in the air wishing you were on the ground. So it's part of the process, and it comes to territory, and sometimes. You just have to wait. And I was explaining to my wife yesterday, it's like I could spend hours and hours looking at the charts, and if there's nothing there, there's nothing there. But when conditions are good, usually about 10 minutes into my analysis, even though it takes me a couple hours to finish everything on average. But on a good day, about 10 minutes into my analysis, in fact, if I didn't have a trading service in an educational business, I probably would quit after about 10 minutes if I found – a couple of setups that I like, one or two, because I usually you find the good stuff is going to rise to the top and kind of jump out at you. Now, the reason I take that other time is because I want to leave no stone unturned. I want to make sure, especially because people are counting on me, that I looked everywhere to find some opportunities and that this truly is the opportunity. But I would say 99 out of 100 times or even more, whatever jumps out of me early on is there. And if I can't find something within, let's say, 10 or 15 minutes, it's probably nothing to do. Now, I'll complete that analysis, and then maybe maybe once at a blue moon, I'll still find something. But I'll complete that analysis knowing that people are depending upon me. So from a selfish standpoint, it sort of forces me to, to do the research. And you know what? It's also nice to get paid to do the research. It's something that I'd be doing anyway. And from all that, I throw off a lot of excess research. I can't do everything myself sometimes. And so that's why I come up with these ancillary lists and, and the color commentary and everything else. And a lot of people could take the ball and run with it and do other things. And that's why I do that. Girl power. Yeah, Jill. Jill's in the service. Richard Dennis said that. Okay. Who was the guy who did the Turtles Traders? So Dennis, you have Dennis. Get good at one pattern. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, Craig says get good at one pattern. Yeah, that's 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 I'm glad you brought that up. Because if you're not good at trading one pattern, what makes you think you'd be good at trading 10? I often tell people just trade persistent pullbacks. And that information's on my website. You gotta dig a little for it. It's it's somewhere out there. Um, it might be in um free reports. If not, watch um, as many YouTube videos as you can stand. I guarantee you it's in there somewhere. But yeah, just find one pattern like persistent pullbacks. Now, the problem with something like persistent pullbacks, it's not a problem. It's a good problem. 
But the problem is you're not going to see a whole lot of signals in mediocre markets. We've gone sideways for about a year in the piece, maybe a little longer, a lot longer, almost two years in the Russell. And that's a broad base index. You're not going to see a whole lot of persistent pullbacks. So you're going to have to sit on your hands and just wait and wait and wait. Most people can't do that. Most people aren't that patient. In such volatile markets as following a plan practical, absolutely. Absolutely. The more volatile a market is, the more, the more important it is to follow a plan. Because the more that market's moving around, the more that market's going to force you to do something you shouldn't do. So absolutely, you have to follow a plan regardless of the market conditions. Now, I'm not saying you won't use a little discretion here and there, and that's part of the plan. Is you once you've reached a level where you could follow a plan, then you could then you could trade even better by tweaking it a little bit, by getting out even though that that profit target is just kind of being flirted with and not quite hit, like the A-Rock we talked about. Okay, uh, let's start shifting gears. Uh, Donald says, uh, do you use any measures of market breadth in your overall outlook of market? I know Greg Morris is big on breadth. Yeah, uh, Greg's really big on, he's done a lot of breadth work, and he has a new updated book on breadth. In fact, I've got it right here on my desk. I need to get around to reading it in case he stops by or gives me a call and asks me what I what I thought about it. Um, and I do intend on reading it, but the way I do my breath work is I do it uh, empirically, meaning that I actually go in and instead of running a breath indicator, which looks at several thousand stocks, it, it, it gives me a, a number, some sort of quantifying of that number, what I do is I actually look at those 2,000 stocks and I see what they're doing. In fact, uh, we should have plenty of time today. I'll, we could do a quick flyby in the tradable universe, and I'll show you what I mean. So if you want to start looking at those those uh, breath indicators and things like that, and you want to factor that into the analysis, your analysis, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I just really like looking at charts to get a feel for what's really going on under the hood, up, down, or sideways. Right now, it'd be a good idea to get good at long-term bottoming transition patterns in metals and mining and gold oil, not gold oil. Yeah, Craig, I fully agree with you. In fact, that's what we've been doing. We've been... Um, We've been looking at those and trading those, uh, CNX, CENX, AROC. Those are all metals and mining and gold stocks. So we'll take a look at the portfolio in a minute. Absolutely. All right, just a couple things I want to run by real quick. And, and, you know, you guys who've been around for a while, you might want well to go get a cup of coffee. Um, but let me just walk you through this real quick for those people who are new or newer to my methodology of service. Now, keep in mind a trend transitional pattern or an emerging trend pattern like we're seeing in those aforementioned commodity-related areas. That's a little bit more complicated, and that's a little bit more um, involved. So before you get to that point, though, you need to understand trends and trend resumption patterns. In other words, a pullback, okay? So you want to make sure you have that strong trend. You want it to be obvious. You want it to be persistent. And I purposely grew, drew this graphic to where the bars tend to go up day after day, and you can draw a line through them. And that's what Craig or somebody was talking about earlier with the persistent pullbacks. So you're waiting for a correction in the trend. The question is, well, Dave, how do we quantify that correction? It all depends on the magnitude of the move, the acceleration of the move, the volatility of the stock. But it has to be deep enough to have knocked out some of the players. Now, if we get the rip-roaring bull market, then we might tweak those parameters a little bit. But that hasn't happened in a while. So in general, you want to make sure that correction has knocked out the players. If you study the TKO pattern, notice that it's, it's just a one-bar pullback, but it's a very sharp pullback, a sharp drop to knock out some people, knock them out the trend. And if that trend begins to resume, they get sucked back in. 
And then it also, and these are the people that are the first to leave, the first to exit, the fast money. They actually take you out with them. Now, I don't want to digress too far. Just real quick, I just want to kind of mostly focus on entries today because it seems like we're getting a lot of questions on that, or I'm getting a lot of questions on that. You want to enter above the market, and if and only if that trend begins to resume and triggers you in. The problem that I'm seeing now, again, it's like the beating of the system. Let's say I recommend the stock continues to drop. Well, people think they enter down here and they beat the system. No, that's not what you want to do. You only want to enter on strength because if this continues dropping, you avoid a trade. As I say, ad nauseum, I'm sick of hearing it myself. I get emails all the time. Hey, Dave, what do I do with XYZ? XYZ, I, I never heard of that stock. Well, you recommended it when? Six months ago. I did? Go back to the records. I look at the records. I go, oh, sure did. Well, but why do I rem why? How come I don't remember? Well, I never triggered. That's why I don't remember. I just kind of forget about it. But people will try to beat the system and buy somewhere down here. You want to at least wait for that market to turn back up and trigger that entry because at least at this particular moment in time, you're on the right side of the market. Now, it might immediately trigger and then come right back in. Well, guess what? That's life. It happens. Spell with a silent SH, okay? So in questionable conditions like right now where the market's kind of choppy, you might put your entry a little further up. And if you're following along with the service, you'll notice that my entries are pretty liberal because what's been happening is a lot of times stocks are rallying up, stall it out, and then roll it right back over. They're triggering that textbook entry, and I did make the mistake in this graphic of making that entry a little bit of a textbook entry. You don't want to enter right above this high the next day unless condition, conditions are super duper fantastic. Okay. So you want to give it a little wiggle room, and I've gave it a little wiggle room here, but even more wiggle room when things are kind of questionable like they are now, just in case it rallies up and it comes back in. Yeah, keep in mind that the market makers, if they see a textbook pullback, they're going to put – they're going to be looking for you to enter right around here, and they're going to figure out a way to push that market up to get you in and then spit you out, okay? So you avoid that noise altogether by using a higher entry. And guess what? If you're using that wiggle rub, you could put it a stop entry, like I talked about at Dodge earlier, and then really go about your business. And if it rallies, the market maker tries to trick you in, eh, you're out taking a walk, walking the dog, feeding the chickens, whatever you have to go do or want to go do, okay? And you avoid losing trade. So make sure you wait for that entry. You only buy on strength. You only buy on strength. Write that down, okay? Once you're triggered, we use a stop. The stop is set based on the volatility of the stock. Not enough time to get into that today, but just know that a stock is moving, if a stock is moving around three and four points a day, if your stop is within that normal noise, so to speak, you will be stopped out of noise alone. That distance sets your initial profit target. Okay? So your risk is actually equal to your reward. It's one for one. Oh, Dave, I heard three for one or four for one. No, no, no. One for one on the first loaf, the first half of your trade, and then hopefully many times to one on the second half. And that's where the real money is if this trend resumes longer term. This just sort of keeps the life lights on, so to speak, keeps you in business, helps to mitigate your drawdowns a little. And this is where the real money is made in the longer term trend. Well, why not just trade a longer term trend? Well, your accuracy is going to be abysmal. You're going to be right maybe 28, 29 percent of the time, if that much. You're going to be wrong. 70 something percent of the time okay but at least if you're taking a swing trade you're somewhere in that 50 50 percent correct or close it depends on market conditions you might hit 70 in it and even great conditions a little bit higher correct okay but we're not going for correct we're going we're, we're here to make money so don't worry about your percent correct but the swing trade will improve the percent correct, and then with the longer term trend, your drawdowns are going to be abysmal. Excuse me. So 
you're going to be wrong a tremendous amount of time if you're trying to capture this long, longer term trend. And you're going to lose a tremendous amount of money because you're going to be wrong so many times and you're risking so much money for that. But if you could risk a small amount on a swing trade and then stick around, okay, we can only predict so far we could follow forever, then you'll do just fine. And then the only other thing I want to point out is once you do get that quote unquote free position and your stop is up to break even, okay, then barring overnight gaps, the worst thing can happen is you stopped out of scratch. So what? I call it the better than a poke in the eye trade. Then you could slowly let this stop widen out. And you can make that transition to that longer term trade. -up. But Dave, you said longer term trading is not accurate. Well, once you get that swing trade out, you've taken some shares off. So that's going to mitigate your drawdowns to open profits. OK, so you won't be losing as much open profits. You won't have as much, but you won't lose as much. But it'll keep you in the game because the drawdowns will be mitigated because you've you've actually put some equity uh, your equity curve is increasing because you put money in your account and then it's going to, your open drawdowns won't be quite as big and your portfolio swings won't be as bad. Now, advanced lesson, I'm getting a lot of people that are really interested in swing trading around the core positions. And that's one thing that I don't recommend specifically in the service just because it's a can of worms. Okay. But to those of you who are a little bit more advanced, yes, you can swing trade around this position. So if this takes off and you take partial profits here and it sets up again, you could take another swing trade and take partial profits here and then hopefully rinse and repeat. And this is how you squeeze a lot more money out of the longer term trend. You still have that core position, but then you're taking some trades around it. OK, that's a more advanced lesson I want to get into anyway. I wanted to cover some of the basics just for some people because they're asking. Howard says, which is better, to buy when ATR is expanding or contracting, or maybe it doesn't matter? Which one? I don't know what ATR is. Uh, Dave, what do I use a three-day rule where you enter on a break at a three-day high last three days? Well, the problem with something like that is you're, it's a short-term signal. So you're saying, are you saying have, the, have a bigger picture set up first and then you, you enter about the three-day high? The only problem with any fixed rule like that is, let's see if we can get a screen up here. If you have some fixed rule, what if what if your three-day bars look like this? Okay, let's say it's a really deep pullback. I, I kind of over-exaggerated that. Let me do that again. Let's say you've got a nice little trend. And what if your three-day bars look like this okay so if you enter above this high by the time it gets all the way up to this high that would be almost the point where you'd be taking profits so you might be wanting to enter somewhere in here so i i would kind of discourage you from coming up with a specific entry rule just because it's too confining okay but there are little tricks and tips i use like let's say that you have a pullback looks like this and then you might have a few days look like that. Well, you don't want to enter above this three-day high, but like this is the bar you start with. Okay, well, I'm going to enter somewhere above this high. Well, notice these highs are right above it. So I know I want to at least be above those, but these are kind of narrow ranges. So maybe I want to be way up here, and this is a four-day high, okay? So you want to be able to look at the chart and use a little discretion. You have a brain in your head, so you want to use it. And I think that if you're trying to quantify too much, I think that's where you get into a lot of trouble. Howard, I know what ATR is. I'm just giving you a hard time. It's like somebody will ask me a question about stochastics, and I'll say, what's stochastics? And they'll send me six pages. They'll, they'll go through this. I got to quit doing that. <laughs> the poor people. They'll explain to me, oh, you know, stochastics, blah, 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 blah. They go on and on about stochastics. No, uh, I know what ATR is. ATR is average true range. I'm, asked, I'm often asked about that a lot. My stops, are my st stops set on ATR? Yes. Do I use ATR? No. Okay. Uh, if, but if you could find a way to make those things work for you, then by all means use them. Again, I'm just kind of an empirical guy. And I became an empirical guy by playing with ATR for years and years and years and years and playing with mechanizing 
Breakout and all these other different systems for years and years and years. And that's how I got I got back to the beginning, like I talked about last week and last week's The Week in Charts. It's like when you get back to the beginning, you start getting that true enlightenment, when you start peeling off all those indicators. But, yeah, go on a journey because I can tell you don't worry about all that. But until you go through the journey, you won't know. You won't understand what I'm trying to say. Okay. So yeah, Greg, I don't know about the three-day high rule. I would, I would, my quick answer to that would be no. I guess it's too late for a quick answer, huh? Bit off topic. Oh well, I'm a bit off topic, so that's fine with me. You seem to eyeball the size of the pullback relative to the volatility of the stock. Should those of us with less practical, less practice, consider using the objective measure of volatility, such as ATR, to estimate when the pullback's deep enough? Average true range. Um, yeah, absolutely. You could use you could use something to help you gauge that pullback. You know, I do use. You'll notice when we get to the charts at the top of every screen, you'll see a historical volatility reading. Okay, and on some of these wild and crazy little stocks, these little oil stocks, because these oil stocks have just gone down, 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 and then they got kind of choppy down here. But these swings are huge. These swings might be thirty percent, forty percent. And then they bottom out and start a rally. This might be like a 60% rally. So even though it doesn't look like the volatility is crazy, it just kind of looks like a stock that just went down and bottomed out. It kind of looks like this, okay? It almost looks boring down here. Well, when I look up at my ATR and I see it's got an AT, I'm ATR, listen to me. You guys are uh, putting words in my mouth. Historical volatility, HV. I'll give you that formula if you need it, Okay. It's it's a good measure of volatility, and it, and the more you look at it, and you compare it to the overall market. Market right now, off the top of my head, I think is 16 for the S&P 500. So if you're trading a stock that's in the 40s, you know it's at least two and change more volatile than the overall market. If you're trading a stock that's in the it's a hundred, then you know it's five times more volatile than the overall market. So that's your first clue. Hey, I better give this stock a lot of room. And then there's a lot more to setting stops than than than, um, than we have time to get into today. But again, just kind of eyeball it, and just know that if this HV is really really high, then you better darn well give it a really wide berth. Okay. So now that's a good question. But yeah, start with HV. Oh, okay. Howard found it. Uh, Rich Dennis. Okay. Uh, I always say that you could publish my trading rules in a newspaper. No one would follow them. The key is consistency and dip discipline. Almost anybody could make up a list of rules that are 80% as good as what we taught our people. What they couldn't do is give them the confidence to stick to the rules, even when things are going bad. Yeah. You know, again, I don't, you can't, I don't think you're going to go out and make money trading in the turtle system. Not in this day and age, unless we get some sort of, Rip roaring commodity market um, or some incredible bull market again in stocks. But as I often say, do read the book by Curtis Faith because there was a lot of stuff in there that that talks about the psychology of trading. For instance, earlier I said uh, Howard or Phil or somebody said put three traders in a room and you're going to get three different results. If even with the say, okay, guys, here are your signals, follow them. And that's one thing that Curtis Faith pointed out is Curtis Faith just followed a system. And he basically didn't give a flip. And he's an interesting uh, character. But, yeah, you definitely need to read his book. My, my bookshelf's all mixed up now. I can't find it right now. But it's uh, it's the one by Curtis Faith, one of the turtle books. And what's interesting that he said along the lines of three different traders, three different results is, is he was printing money. And some of the other traders began to hate him. Because they thought he knew some sort of secret or was doing something secretly or was cheating the system or something. And then even when they, they, they played a lot of ping pong and he became good at ping pong and they thought he was cheating the system there. He was just playing a lot of ping pong. And it's just that, that mentality of certain people. But all he was doing was taking the signals and following them, whereas the other guys were, I guess, sharpshooting them or getting out early or whatever the case may be. So, yeah, read that book for sure. 
Traders can look at a few months of trading and pick the largest day pullback as an indication of how a stock may move. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing, too, is just – I do that, too, Craig. I'm glad you pointed that out. In fact, we'll uh, get the charts in just one second. If I see it jump out of me, I'll let you know. But, yeah, if, you, if you're looking at a stock – and every now and then, it has a wide range bar, okay? So let's say that like this bar here was was a little bit, was like a lot bigger like that, okay? And say you had one over here that looked like this. So when you're eyeballing that chart, you're like, oh, wait a minute. This thing might have an ATR of two points at two points, whatever that is, okay? So let's say it has an ATR of two points based on the look back, and that's what I'm saying, whatever that is, whatever the look back is. But if you're looking at the stock, and every now and then it seems to kind of go a little crazy, well, that ATR doesn't fully reflect that craziness because it's going to average it out if you're looking at a longer ATR or it's going to drop off if you're looking at a shorter ATR. So that's the only problem with looking at these statistics. Statistics are worthless. 73.4% of all people know that, okay? So use these things as tools. If you want to use ATR, knock yourself out. Use it as a tool. But then, like Craig pointed out, little things like looking at the price chart, and if there's a big wide bar every now and then, that clues you in that this stock has a potential to be volatile. Dave, what do you consider your best book? The Layman's Guide to Trading Stocks, I think, is my best book. Oh, you mean by somebody else? Oh, I don't know. It's it's kind of hard to pick. I mean, there's so many gems in so many of these books, um, or I should say in so few of these books. I had a list on my website, but it got messed up. I mean, there's, there's little things like um, – uh, Gann has a book, How to Make Profits in Commodities. Read the first 20 or 30 pages of that and then throw away the rest of it. You could just rip out the first 20 pages. Uh, Livermore, read uh, Reminiscences of a Stock Operator would be another good uh, good something for you to read. And then, of course, uh, read uh, Mark Douglas. Rest in peace, Mark. Um, read his books. Uh, Disciplined Trader was the one that struck a chord with me. I haven't read it in 10 years. I probably should read it again. Uh, that was my favorite by him. And then, you know, read some of these old books on technical analysis, like Schaubacher, technical analysis of price trends, I think, and, of course, Edwards and McGee. So there's quite a few of them that you should read. Um, but I guess looking at the couple hundred here in my bookcase, uh, 191 of them probably uh, <laughs> are worth reading. But if you, can get, if you can get one or two good ideas or thoughts out of a book, I think it's worthwhile, just like the Curtis Faith book. You're not gonna you're not gonna become a turtle trader anymore, okay? But read the book because it's got a few little gems in it. So, but yeah, I'll get that up. If you shoot me an email, I'll I'll um I'll make that a priority, and I'll get the list of books back up. A lot of the ones I just said are, are on that list. So uh, shoot me an email. I'll be happy to um to put that back up. Yeah, Stan Weinstein is a good book. I read that a little later in my career, and uh, people have compared some of the ways I approach the market to uh, to him. Whatever happened to him? It's like uh, he, he kind of – I don't know where he went. What is the simplest, easiest to understand book on options and option strategies? Well, I don't know if it's the simplest, but you have to, you have to read Larry McMillan's book, and I'm friends with Larry, uh, but he's the one who wrote the first book the first real book on options. So you have to read his book. Uh, Saliba's has a workbook on options, Tony Saliba. And uh, I'm not really friends with Saliba, but I know uh, the guy he co-wrote it with, um, Joe Corona. Joe Corona uh, co-wrote it with him. So uh, and Joe's, a, Joe's a fun guy, nice guy. So uh, – I think it's called the options workbook. Maybe that would be a little bit more simpler. So I, I would read those two if you want to get into options. Uh, my best advice for you is don't <laughs> uh, when it comes to options. Uh, unless, unless you know, you're going to make that your livelihood, unless you're kind of like an engineering background. Larry Millen's a, an engineer, so he understands 
fully what he's doing. He understands the volatility and, and the implied volatility and all these crazy things. And it's a complex world. It's a really complex world. Just And, and I would recommend you don't sell options, whatever you do. That's a great way to have a very, very uh, brilliant but brief career. Stan Weinstein is a mental trap. Too much of the book is written in the negative. Um, it's been a while since I read it, so I don't remember uh, too much. <laughs> yeah, Jill, I think that's uh, um, it might be. Um, yeah, RJ, I was joking when I said my best book. When you said, "What's what do you consider my best book?" <laughs> yeah, uh, some of the ones I mentioned, but shoot me an email, and I'll get that. Uh, when I switched over to the new website, the the Amazon links didn't didn't carry over, but I had a page full of books I'd recommend. Oh, he's still around. Okay, global trend alert. All right, we'll check that out. Can you email me that just so I can uh, remember it? The art of risk investing. RJ says Zacharat Zac. Zohara, wait, how do you, my eyes are, did I have glasses? <laughs> Z-O-H-O, Z-A-H, Zar, Zartak, the art of low risk investing. I uh, never heard of it, but I'll check it out. All right, Stan, Stan Weinstein's still around. Good to know. Okay. Yeah, Martin, I can't, uh, financialsense.com, I can't publish that in here. But yeah, so Stan Weinstein. Well, that's good. That's good. I'm glad he's still around. Good for him. Stan Weinstein's book. You only need to read the first 150 pages. He actually tells you what to stop reading. <laughs> All right, looks like we're getting a couple thumbs up for Stan's book and only one thumb down. So it's it's that's a consensus, I suppose. All right, let's hop into the charts. Um. Oh. Like I said earlier, um, let me just check in the books real quick. But, oh, if you want the um, two things, if you want the delayed service, if you go to Get Started on here on my website, Getting Started from the home page, you can get the delayed service there. And somebody asked me, he said, Dave, you're more than a week behind. Well, what happens is if I get a signal, a live signal, then sometimes I let the I, I, I let the delay increase a little bit. But there's a couple things. Somebody was asking about patterns earlier. The free reports are, are under free education. And there are free reports under the store, okay? And then there's a bunch of stuff in the free educa education and then, where are the books? Somewhere in the books page. Oh, I know where. If we go to store under books, there's um, a list of books. Let me see if that list is still up. If not, i got to fix it. All right, if you guys want to start asking questions about individual stocks, feel free to do so now. And I promise not to take a, yeah, right here. No, I took it down. Um, I'll, I'll get the um, I'll get it back up. Okay, let me just go over the overall market real quick, and then you guys start asking about individual stocks. If you don't mind, just ask about one stock at a time, and then hit return. You can ask about as many as you want. Just put them one stop at a time. That way, I make sure I get to all of your picks. All right, let's take a look at the peas now. It's kind of interesting with markets, and this is one thing I was thinking about this morning, is it feels like this market is just going straight up. And it has, but when you look at the last week or so, we've actually lost some steam in here. So never forget about the net-net change. Where is the market? Where was the market? And look back a day, a week, a month, a year, or many years, okay? So since the middle of March, March 17th, 
to where we are at this particular moment in time. So that's what, three weeks or so, round numbers. We haven't made any progress at S&P 500. Now, before that, it looked like it was kind of going straight up in here. You could see. But now we kind of plateaued a little bit. It's not the end of the world. But what's concerning is a little bit longer term, as you connect the dots to the highs, low to highs, you can see that's a pretty good run in here. And now we're bumping up against a lot of overhead supply, overhead resistance. Again, these is an area where there's likely a lot of trading. People might be looking to get out of break even. So the way I feel, it's like, okay, who cares about trading between here and there? If the market can come way up here, if it could break out and stay there, then I'm all in, okay? Or at least I'm feeling better about the market. But I think you have to take a bit of a show-me approach and let the market prove itself. Uh, I don't want to look at too much of the micro, but what was that dig up day we had recently? Was that a Fed day? Well, everybody that brother had to own stocks, and now look where we look where we are, okay? I mean, you could probably – I'm not a short-term trader, but you could probably trade that as a system in and of itself, and, and I would encourage you not to do it because you're going to make a little, make a little, make a little, make a little, and the potential for big loss is there, and the potential for big gain is not. With that said, with that caveat – you could probably say, okay, let's take a look at spider. This might be a better way of showing this. You could probably say, okay, when we have a big positive Fed day, I'm going to short that market if it takes out that low because all the people that got excited in that day are going to be bailing out when the market takes it out. So you could probably just trade that as a system in and of itself. It would work. I think it would work. But the problem is a short-term system, you wouldn't make enough money. Yeah, let's get back to the cash. Let's back the market way out. And again, the net net thing, okay? So it depends on where you go back in 2014. You could pretty much, we're up a few percent or break it even. Not enough to get excited about one way or the other. So it's a pretty serious sideways movement. Take a look at the weekly chart. And you can see it's a, little, a lot of these things are a little bit more obvious in here. Now, I'm not a screaming bear. Uh, we haven't shorted a stock in weeks. But Dave, I thought you're bearish. Well, not necessarily bearish. I'm being prudent and cautious. Two different things. I certainly don't want to rush out and buy this market as a general statement. But if I see something setting up that I like, then I'll go after it. And that goes for the long side and the short side. And guess what? If this market's just kind of going sideways, especially longer term like this, there's nothing wrong with sitting in your hands. If you if you can't find a setup to save your life and you're looking at this market and you could draw a big sideways arrow going back 2014, 2013 to Russell, then maybe it's okay not to be trading, okay? Let's take a look at NASDAQ. Same sort of action, kind of uh, running out of a little steam here, right around this old highs. My problem, as I talked extensively last week, is it's very hard when a market's at high levels. High levels, look, see, this is high levels. All-time highs, been going up for years and years and years. Very hard for a market to sustain a V-shaped recovery. Because by the time it gets all the way back to its old highs, it's already a little bit exhausted, okay? So that's one reason why I'm not too excited about the NASDAQ either. Now, if it goes on to make new highs, we'll see what happens. We're trying to follow worse, okay? Follow being a key word in that sentence. Russell 2000, not so good, okay? Uh, you can see kind of mostly sideways in here, kind of peeped up a little bit. It's come back in. So shorter term, not so good. Back the chart out again, 2013, way back here. Draw your line, kind of sideways, right? And then that's a new thing with the kids. I know, right? <laughs> I don't know why they say that. I know, right? So take a look at the weekly S&P 500. Just connect the dots. Connect the high to the low, okay, the highest high to the lowest low, and then once you do that, bring it up to today. And so far, to me, that just looks like a, let's see if I can take the chart out. You should be able to do this. 
I don't have it set up. But yeah, uh, when in doubt, take the chart out. So that's one thing I used to do. Let's take a look at like a weekly. And then let me just black out the chart for you, show you something really quick. So if we black out the chart, that to me just looks like a pullback, a deep retracing pullback, but a pullback nonetheless. Okay. All right. As far as setups or sectors, I should say, some of these areas like retail have made these very impressive recoveries. And if you're only looking at, it's kind of like the, the, the touching the elephant. If you're only touching the trunk, it feels like a rope. If you're touching the leg, it feels like a tree. So if you're only looking at this, it's like it doesn't look too bad. If you only look at the last leg up, you're like, oh, it's had a pretty good leg up. Now it's pulling back. You could argue a little bit, or I would argue that, hey, well, it looks like it's kind of pulling back this breakout level. But as a general statement, it's gone up, and it's pretty impressive, and it hit all-time highs. But it's a V-shaped recovery at high levels. And if this thing falls much below the highs, then there's a chance whoever got sucked in here is going to get spit out. And whoever was fortunate enough to get in earlier might be looking to take some profits as they begin to erode. So, again, there's a lot of psychology, believe me, behind technical analysis. Uh, real estate, you know, it's kind of hard for me to get excited about real estate because it's a lower volatility type of sector. But same sort of action, V-shaped at high levels. It's just kind of hard for me to get excited about it. Drugs have, have caught a bid. At least they caught a bid yesterday. So they're waking up a little bit. I don't see any reason to rush out and buy drugs now, but they might be worthwhile at some point. I still feel pretty good about the energies. I'm not seeing a whole lot of new setups there, so I'm kind of sitting tight. I'm kind of in sit tight trend following mode there as opposed to rush out and put on a bunch of trades, hoping to get the sweet trade, and then have that turn into longer-term trade. I'm just not seeing a whole lot of new setups. And that's not a shocker if you look at the fact that it made a new high not that long ago, and now we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. We're going on three weeks of trading since that new high. And with a pullback, you want to get in within several days. It could be one day on a trend knockout, but you want to get in within several days of that old high up to maybe seven or eight back. So uh, depends on the market condition, depends on the setup. Uh, with longer term, if you're in a longer term trend and you have like a pullback that might go maybe 10 or 11 bars, in some cases it still might be worthwhile. But when you're coming off of a new trend like this where the market makes major, major lows, you don't want to see it pull back for too long because you want to see it take off again. Okay, so that's the only thing that has me a little concerned about the energies is that they've pulled back a little too long in here. But that's okay uh, as long as they catch their breath and go back up again. Let's take a look at metals and mining. Same sort of action there too. A little shorter term, lost a little bit of steam in here, but they've had a pretty darn good run. Maybe they just need a break, okay? Okay, RJ says uh, Labu three times. Yes, yeah, open up for individual stocks. Labu, no, I'm not going to like it. Well, the only thing I want to point out is uh, some of these defensive issues. Go in and watch last week's presentation. It's still very relevant. Uh, defensive issues like foods and toilet paper are broken out, but I'm just having a hard time getting excited about those areas, and they really haven't broken out that much. Foods aren't that far past their prior highs in here, so – and then plus, who wants to buy foods? They're kind of a, a boring area. The problem with a lower volatility area is something bad could always happen. So I'd rather know, I'd rather uh, better the devil you know. And if you go to free reports, which is at the bottom of the store, you can get those. I'll make you walk through this through the uh, through the gift shop to get there. Uh, RJ, I'm not gonna like I'm I'm anti leveraged unless you're gonna day trade, which I also would encourage you not to do. I would recommend you not try to trade these leveraged uh, ETFs. Here's the deal. Let's say the the unleveraged one requires a, um, a five-point stop. Well, three-time leverage will require a 15-point stop. So it all comes out in the wash. Plus, the tracking error is going to be abysmal 
on something with all this leverage. So unless you're day trading them, which I avoid, I avoid. Angelo wants to know about IAG. IAG was on our watch list for a while, and it just pulled back too many days, okay? So we took it off. It looked fantastic back here. It was kind of that double top knockout look to it. It made a great run from lows. It made this little minor double top. Double top knockout pattern. I think I wrote about that in 2000 or 1999. I forget when. But then it's just too many days of the pullback. Now, it doesn't mean that it can't still go higher. It's just that it's no longer a uh, ripe setup, if that's the word, for the methodology. The methodology doesn't, doesn't always capture every move. Okay. BCC for Don. Uh, no, I don't see anything to get excited about there. Uh, longer term downtrend still in place. Probably has a bit of a bow tie on it. Yeah, it looks like it's trying to bottom out. It's just kind of hard for me to get excited. You had this big wide range bar down and just kind of clawing its way back up. Uh, I don't know. It just doesn't jump out at me as something that I would get that excited about. But I hear you. It looks like it's trying to turn a corner. FCX, you say too many days, but it looks like a bull flag. All right, let's take a look at that. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Um, you know, these commodities can be a little tough. Yeah, I don't think it's too many days in this particular case. Okay, here's an exception. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. Yeah, it's quite a few days, but you still have the bow tie coming off of all-time lows. Or, or all-time lows? Let's check that. Yeah, all-time lows are close enough. So I, I, I'll give that a not bad, Phil, and I wouldn't really call it a bull flag. I mean, I hear what you're saying. It kind of looks like a bull flag. That's okay, uh, but just use a liberal entry on it, and then I wouldn't give it that many days to trigger. And take, oh, by the way, take a look at the HV, 108. What, was, what were we saying earlier? That HV means it's going to require a pretty wide stop. So this stock probably will require at least, I'd say, 20% on the stop. <gasps> I can't trade with a 20% stop. Well, then you well, then you don't get no coke. You know, you can't trade F FCX if you can't use a big stop. All right, Bob wants to know about AES. That's going to be a utility stock. Uh, hard for me to get excited about utilities. Uh, this would It's got some overhead supply along the way. Uh, I think I would pass. Uh, let's, let's zoom in a little bit. I hear you. It, it kind of has a double top knockout look to it. You could certainly do a lot worse. Okay, it's not a bad looking setup. Uh, maybe a slightly deeper pullback, but I think I would pass because it's going to have some overhead supply to deal with. Hey, you know what, Dave, if I get 13, 14 bucks out of a trade, would that be good? Yeah, but it's just not worth it. So this looks pretty good over here, but longer term, it's got some issues. John wants to know about BTG. That's going to be a gold stock. Let's see, BTG. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a little bit uh, lower priced, but it has really good volume uh, on a pullback. It's got, I think it needs a little bit of a knockout. Based on the magnitude of the move, that's a pretty big move. It's uh, doubled, tripled over a short period of time. So I would only go after this one if it made a deep pullback, okay? And being lower priced, a little bit more speculative, and it's going to have – it might have some problems along the way, but if you double your money, I guess it'd be all right. But, yeah, be careful in that one. USO, USO, USO. It's like a Trump rally. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. But, um, yeah, USO, this is crude. Uh, it's a little disappointing in that it looked like a bottom was in place. It rallied up, and then it's kind of come back in. Um the energies have been making this process bottom for a long time. It looks like they finally took off recently. Notice we have some in the portfolio, but then now it's coming back in. XME for Carol. XME. Carol, I think I sent you some emails a while back. I don't know if you got them or not. Uh, uh, it's kind of flattened out in here. I'm still kind of bullish on the metals, but I think I would leave. I wouldn't rush out and buy them. Now, I mean, if you were playing from – see this bow tie here? And you've got a nice little pullback, and it took off. As we were playing the metals, 
not long ago. Let's take a look at the portfolio. Uh, you should already be long some metals by this point. Here, here's an aluminum company. Okay. Uh, long from back here, hit the profit target. It's, it's having a bit of a retrace now. Womp, womp. You know, what are you going to do? Okay. Maybe we just get better than poking the eye trade. So what? Here's another. This is uh, considered an energy company or it's a metal. Might be coal. But uh, I forget where we got in, but we had the bow tie back here. So the point is, like with the XME, if you're looking at some of these stocks like a rock, okay. You had the bow tie back here, and then it's since kind of it's pulling back a little bit. It came dangerously close to that, um, or excitingly close, however you want to look at it, to that initial profit target. So the point is that if you were paying attention, and I'm not beating you up, Carol, but if you were paying attention, the, the play in the energy, the metals and mining was, was a was a month and a half ago. Now we're kind of back to show me mode. Remember I said a few minutes ago, we're not seeing many setups. Somebody asked me this morning, Dave, you had DVN on your um, Landry list, but you took it off. Why? It's like, well, it's just so many days that the pullback is kind of flattened out in here. It doesn't mean that the stock has it bottomed out and it looks like it has. I just don't see it as a new setup anymore. Okay. If you took the trade, then that's great. That's fine. Okay. So far, so good. But I'm just not seeing it as a new setup. There's not a whole lot to get excited about Excited about this juncture. Phil wants to know about EXK. That's going to be a silver stock. Yeah, it looks okay. Quite a few days of the pullback. I mean, the run from lows has been pretty impressive. So it's going to be dangerous. It's going to be wild and crazy. HV, look at that, up towards 100. Anything triple digits, a little dangerous. I just would prefer at a case like this, when you see, see a stock double or triple over a short period of time, to have a deeper pullback, okay, to knock a few more people out. GDX is going to be gold. That's gold miners. That's the major gold miners. Um, yeah, it looks okay. It's kind of choppy in here. Uh, you can see it's kind of bottomed out, and that's why we've been kind of bullish in some of these areas. And it's kind of getting through this supply. I wouldn't see it as a new setup. Let's see if it could break out and then maybe look to play a pullback. But I would rather play the individual issues instead of, a, of an ETF. Measured percent change in the SPXL from 2009. SPXL. Oh, it's, yeah. Okay. Measured percent change from the 2009 low. Michael's got a point here. Let's see what Michael's point is. This might, I might be thinking you for this. Let's go to 2009 low. What's the 2009 low? I guess it's right there. Oh, 1736. Okay. So three times. So yeah, it's going up. You're saying it's going up a lot? But very dangerous to try to hold on to that. I mean, measure the percent change from here to here. 31%. So, I mean, you could easily have a 50% drawdown. You could, you could make a lot of money, but then, then lose half of it. Art wants to know about CPXX. Why does that feel like a, a metal for some reason? Uh, this, this is just ludicrous. Even ludicrous would say that's ludicrous. There's a jump from 2 to 12. No, it's a, what I call a bottle rocket. When it goes straight up like this, it would go up like several hundred percent. I would avoid them because a lot of times it just come right back in. It's too dangerous, way too dangerous. You're welcome. GBT. Yeah, this is like something that's bottoming out. A little bit on the thin side. Now, with IPOs, one thing I do like about um, when they get their timing wrong or – the uh, they flub the IPO and by flub the IPO notice that they really didn't get much more than where they with the opening week or whatever out of it and then it implodes like this I call it um, I think I call that baby come back so yeah that looks pretty good I would watch this for a setup on your first little knockout move uh, yeah I, I, I would almost give you a high five it's just not set up yet but absolutely and this is in my IP list I've been keeping an eye on it so this could be worthwhile soon absolutely 
Michael, what was your point about the 3X, that it's, it's did a good job? It's up 1,700%. Nice webinar. Thank you, Steve. Steve, what's know about O-L-L-I? Uh, bargain outlet. Obviously, a retail stock hitting new highs. It's kind of wide and loose and choppy. Uh, but, yeah, on a pullback, it might be worthwhile. Here's another one of those cases where notice the IPO just kind of dies out, gets his act together, and then takes off again. Susan says, AMLP for income, probably not your style. I'm older and slower, AMLP. Well, I wouldn't consider anything for income. Um, no, it's got an H fee of 54. That's not bad. Uh, that's some, some kind of, uh, what, what kind of fund is this? It looks okay. It looks like it's bottomed out, but it's lost steam as of late. So if you're long, stay long, have a stop. But notice it has gone anywhere in a month and change, six weeks. Long-term only patience. Yeah, but it, you, you could get, uh, it's dangerous to, to, to hang on to a triple leveraged thing for a long time. Okay, GDXJ is going to be Gold Miners Junior, GDXJ. Uh, broken out of a bull pennant pattern, which targets 40, nearly gotten over most of overhead supply. Yeah, I mean, I'm encouraged by the action of these goals. Gold has been hard for us to get on because it's been such a wide and loose and crazy rally there. They kind of went straight up, and then they just chopped all around. And we really didn't get a whole lot of setups. But, yeah, I hear you. Uh, certainly looking good today, making new highs as a trend follower. I, I can't uh, argue with that. Bob, BWXT, BWXT. My problem with this one, as I've told you at nauseam, is that I didn't like the fact that it was you're buying that V-shaped recovery at the high level. And now it's pulling all the way back to the prior area in here. I guess if you didn't have all this trading here and you were just seeing this up here, it would look a lot better. But now it's pulled back to its breakout levels. I would leave that alone. I would still leave that alone. <laughs> Bob sure wants this one to work. I guess he's already long. Otherwise, he wouldn't bring it up. Yeah, this EDIT is just too crazy. Um, it went from 50 to 45 to 25. It's just all over the place. I mean, you could, say, you could argue that. Remember what I said earlier? When you have a market that makes a sharp run over a short period of time, you want a sharp pullback. Well, that's a good example here. But this is actually one where the, the early breakout, as I have drawn in here, was pretty cool on that one. But it's just too crazy now. But if it goes on the new highs and starts to uh, keeps trending, then by all means. Okay, we're going to have to go to lightning round. Almost out of time. Okay, we did that one. We did that one. Index is consolidating above 200 SMA except for the Russell. Okay. Uh, again, for me to get excited about the SP 500, I have to go to new highs. D or Art, what's known about D R W I? Uh, again, it went from two to ten. That's a 500 percent rally over a short period of time. It's just too crazy, and now it's got a gap down. Uh, avoid that one like the plague. MLP. Yeah, the, the, the reason that one doesn't have HV on the edit is because it's not long enough. No, this is too thin. Whoever said this, no, we can't, you can't talk about that. Uh, yeah, we don't have 50 days. See, we don't have 50 days for the HV, but you could put in like a 40 day HV or something. And it's probably would be about 170 or something like that. I'd leave it alone. Okay, gotcha. That MLP was supposed to be MLP. Okay, one more. NCS for us, any? Yeah, I mean, this looks pretty good. Uh, a little bit on the thin side, but not horribly so. On a pullback, maybe. Uh, but it's going to have a lot of issues along the way. So I think you could find something else out there. Or I would sit tight until something else comes along. Okay. 
Thanks again, Dave. Another 10 rated show. 10 being high, not 100. <laughs> Thanks, John. Well, look, uh, it looks like we're out of time here, so I need to wrap things up. I appreciate you guys showing up for these. Uh, I enjoy doing them, as you, doing them, as you can tell. Any unanswered questions or anything um, not covered you want covered, shoot me an email, and I'll either answer you directly or it'll be fodder for next week's show because a lot of times I wake up thinking, hey, what do I want to talk about? And if you guys give me something to talk about ahead of time, it makes my life a lot easier. So feel free to uh, suggest things. Anyway, uh, if we don't talk between now and then, everyone have a fantastic weekend. I hope to see all you guys and girls next week. You, you're welcome. You're welcome, Leon. You're welcome, Joe. You're welcome.